screen printing basics. Well, you could literally talk for hours about all the different variables within the process, but for the purpose of this, we're going to try to keep it more to some of the critical things associated with the process and how they affect what you're doing out on the lines every day. So first we're going to talk about the screen or the stencil, a little bit about ink, then printing process and environment, how they all kind of influence each other. So if you do run into problems, point you in the right direction on how to fix the problem. So within the screen, uh, frame's a critical component, then you've got the mesh or the fabric, the tension of the screen, and the emulsion you're putting on the screen to create the stencil. A lot of different types of frames out there, uh, aluminum tubing, which is probably the most common. Some people are still using wood. Some of the older machines use a cast type frame, particularly for uh, thermoplastic printing. And you have custom frames out there or specialty type frames. The critical thing about the frame is you want to size the frame or you want the image size to not exceed 45% of the idea of the frame. And as we get into the printing process, part of this presentation, there'll be some diagrams that show you why you want to do that. So, general rule of thumb, the more room you have from the image to the inside of the frame, the easier it's going to be to print and the more longevity you're going to get out of the screen. Well, just some examples of some different types of frames. Uh, flatness, you want the frame flat so it's not warped. Uh, can cause your registration problems. Same with being square. Can cause your re poor registration and excessive setup times. Key thing with the frames is try to standardize if at all possible. If you have 30 different frames and you can narrow it down to two, it's going to save you a lot of time in setting up the press and changing over every time you go to a different job. Getting into the fabric or the mesh, there's two predominant ones being used today are uh, monofilament polyester. It's used for both inorganic and organic inks. Uh, it's very forgiving, has elast excellent elasticity and recovery. It's economical and it offers good registration and durability. Stainless steel is used pr primarily for inorganic inks with ceramic inks, uh, thermoplastic. It's very unforgiving. Uh, put your thumbprint in it, screen's ruined. It's ex expensive in comparison to, to the polyester, but it does offer excellent registration and durability. Mesh count, this is how many threads per inch you have. Has a direct effect on your ink consumption, your ink deposit, your ink opacity how high you can touch in the screen, which can affect your screen line. Factors to consider for inorganic inks is the frit particle size of two to five microns, your desired opacity and desired screen lines. General rule of thumb, the higher you go in mesh count, the more detail you're gonna retain in your image and the finer detail you can print. Typically for ceramic or inorganic inks, most people are using mesh counts and the 140 to 230 range for polyester and 165 to 325 threads per inch for stainless steel. For organic inks, uh, particularly the UVs, the majority are using mesh counts in the ranges of 195 to 380. There are exceptions to that depending on the fineness of detail you're trying to print. The thread diameter of the fabric Typically, you want to use the finest thread diameter possible when you're printing small dots or fine detail. However, we are printing on glass with ground up glass and the ink. So the thicker threads tend to be more, more common because of the aggressiveness of those inks to get any kind of screen, uh, screen life. Has a direct effect on how the ink flows to the edge of the stencil because the thinner thread leaves more ink exposed to the glass and results less results in less resistance for the ink to transfer. And typically, stainless steel threads are much thinner than the polyester, so they automatically give you that advantage. So if you look at this slide here, we have the same threads per inch, but we have three different thread diameters. But if you look at the blue, 
that's basically your ink tunnel. It's going to take a lot less force to transfer this than it will this onto the glass substrate. So you're going to get much better resolution as well. Screen tension. Um, there's been a lot of scuttlebutt throughout the years that if you're printing at, say, 10 newtons today, you should be printing at 20 newtons tomorrow, 30 newtons the next week. The people making these recommendations never print a piece of glass in their life. So what I've seen throughout the years is it should be as high as your process will allow. Keep in mind a lot of what I'm going through is what they would call no variables. This is the perfect way to screen print. We're printing on glass. Nothing's perfect about printing on glass. So there are compensations you have to make to make it work. So depending on what your desired outcome is, you may have to make adjustments to, to, to get it to work for what you're trying to do. <clears throat> Where was I at? So when you're printing with stainless steel mesh on curved surfaces, you may have to lower that tension just because there is no elasticity with stainless steel and you're going to deform the fabric. <clears throat> Higher tension uh, has a direct effect on your overall mesh count, your overall mesh thickness, your overall mesh opening, and your thread diameter. So in reality, what you can do by stretching the screens tighter with a thicker thread is still create the advantage of using the thinner thread. Other advantages uh, can lower your ink consumption, longer screen life, if set up correctly, better print quality, more consistent process, lower costs and more throughput. General point, tighter the screen, the lower you can run the screen to the glass, the faster you can run the squeegee, the more bottles you're going to get printed. Uh, disadvantages, it can bring to the forefront other process related problems if you continue to have problems with contamination coming in on the glass or something in the ink or whatever, particularly with polyester, it's going to rip a lot easier. The emulsion, which is what creates the stencil, you want to make sure it's compatible to the ink system you're using, whether it's solvent-based, water miscible, or UV. In regards to emulsion thickness, we typically recommend 10 to 20% emulsion over the mesh for most printing applications. And contrary to popular belief, it has little effect on ink deposit except in fine detail areas. So a lot of people, if they're getting a lot of pinholes or they're not getting enough ink deposit on the glass, one of, one of the tricks of the trade is, well, we'll just increase the emulsion thickness. That'll give us longer, that'll give us longer run time with the screen then we'll get more ink down on the glass. Uh, got a couple slides coming up here that kind of shows what happens when you do that. Uh, there's also a buzz term called RZ value, which is how smooth the stencil is when it comes in contact with the glass. You want it smooth, so it provides a good gasket, but when you're printing on glass, you don't want it too smooth or else you create a vacuum effect, which then creates a static issue. You always want that build up to be on the substrate side of the screen so it gives you a good gasket when, it, when you do the printing process so the ink doesn't bleed out. So in reality, by increasing the emulsion thickness on the screen, anything less than 500 microns, you will increase that ink deposit. But when you get beyond that, the only place you're going to increase your emulsion thickness is on the very edge of the stencil. Keep in mind that the mesh controls better than 80% of your overall deposit of ink anyway. So all these other all these other variables play a very minimal role. As far as RZ, if you, if you don't have a smooth stencil, you're going to see you see bleeding out beyond the edge of the stencil. Which a lot of times, once you fire the glass, you might see a little haze or halo around the edge of the print. That could be caused by that. Or if you had a smooth stencil, you'd get a nice crisp print. Uh, getting in the inks, and we're just going to touch on this real quick. Uh, the types of inks, basic components, and application methodologies. 
the first we have the inorganic, which is also known as the ceramic enamel, ceramic frit, ceramic paint, but it's better described as a glass enamel. It's a high temperature fire, usually between 1050 and 1200 degrees F. It's available in leaded and non-leaded. Uh, I know there's a push to go non-leaded, but that does limit your color palette. It's available in both paste or pellet form, or most people call it hot milk. And once it's fired on, once it's fired, it's permanent on the glass. <coughs> Then you have the organics, which are low temperature cures, usually around three to 400 for a specific time period, or a UV cure. Some of those out, some of them out there do require a heat bump to get that ultimate durability. Uh, you have an unlimited color palette, but there is some limited durability, and a lot of them do require a catalyst or harder for additional durability. So basic components of an inorganic, Enamel, you have the glass frit, your pigments or dyes, and the medium, which is the carrier for those two components. Then on the organic side, you have the pigments or dyes, the medium, some oligo oligomers and binders, and possibly a catalyst or hardener. Uh, some application methods for different types of ink. You have a spray coating, which is applied at a very low viscosity. I would say water light. You have curtain coating, which is applied at a low viscosity. I'd say like a heavy IPA beer type viscosity. Then you have roll coating, which is what we call a medium viscosity or oil light. And then you have screen printing, which is applied at high viscosity, which is honey or molasses like. And for the printing part of this, we're going to focus strictly on the screen printing part of it. There are exceptions depending on what your desired results are. Well, getting into the meat and potatoes here um, with the printing process, we'll talk a lot about the squeegee uh, and its effect, uh, flooding or flood bar, off contact, and you'll start seeing how things, how you make the screen affect how you set it up on the press and what those inherent uh, things can do. For the squeegee, the material is the most common material. There are a lot of different urethanes out there, so you want to make sure that whatever squeegee you're getting will hold up to the wear and solvent attack that it's going to be uh, subject to. Some urethanes are more solvent resistant than others, so you got to be careful there. There's a lot of different shapes, styles, and sizes out there depending on your application. I do, I go into a lot of plants to, to help people out with printing problems or get a lot of phone calls. They're having a problem with this or, or that. One of the first questions I'm gonna ask you is what squeegee durometer are you using? And nine out of 10 people will say red, yellow, black, clear, yellow. Well, every squeegee manufacturer color codes their squeegees differently. So it's a good idea or a good practice to know what that number durometer is. So if you call me with a specific problem, I might recommend either you go up or down a durometer based on what that issue is. That durometer does, however, affect your ink deposit. The higher the durometer you go, the less ink you're going to lay down because it's going to shear more ink off the screen. Uh, your substrate dictates what durometer you're going to use. If you're printing on a very hard substrate with glass. You're sandwiching a screen in between it. You don't want to use a super hard squeegee and sandwich it in between the screen. You're not going to have any screen life. Solvents will change that durometer over time. The longer they're submersed in you know, acetones, lacquer thinners, mineral spirits, even, even some of the chemicals in the ink will change that durometer over time. So if you start today using a 70 durometer, and you continue to use that for weeks in or continue to clean it and reuse it over and over again, it's not going to be a 70 durometer anymore. It's going to be more like a 75 or even up to 80, which is going to change your deposit, which can change your color. Now these, like I said, there's a lot of different profiles out there. I 
see that's the predominant one for a lot of glass printing. I see a lot of this for bottle decorating, even some of this. Throughout the years, the squeegee manufacturers have come up with what they call these multi durometer squeegee configurations to provide more rigidity to squeegee and still give you the flexibility of the softer durometer. Uh, for example, this one here, this may be a 70 durometer, which is what's actually the printing aspect of it, but the upper part of this is a 90 durometer squeegee, so it doesn't flex as much. I'm gonna date myself here, but back in the day, when we didn't have this technology, we would just take a, uh, I don't have a picture here. We'd take a piece of metal and shove it up in the squeegee holder to keep that squeegee from bending over so much. Uh, edge quality. <clears throat> this is, I, I see this a lot in about everywhere I go. It's the single most important variable of squeegee. I tell customers to sing the most important part of your entire printing process, and here's why. You've got a lot of money tied up in equipment. You've got a lot of money tied up in ink. You've got a lot of money tied up in screens. At the end of the day, this little piece of urethane is what's giving you your final product. If you don't take care of that, you can have the best screens in the world, you can have the best equipment in the world, you can have the best ink in the world. But if this is garbage, it don't matter. You're gonna get junk, garbage in, garbage out. Keep it clean and sharp, uh, and it, this comes directly from the squeegee manufacturers. Let it sit for 24 hours after you clean it, 24 hours after you sharpen it. Uh, the reason they say that is you need the solvents that you're using to clean it or the solvents that were in the ink to completely evaporate out of that urethane. And if you try to use a squeegee too, if you sharpen a squeegee too soon after you clean it and you sharpen it, you're going to get the appearance of a sharp edge, but within 50 prints or so of using that squeegee, that edge is gone. So by letting it stabilize, letting those solvents evaporate back out of it, you're going to have a more consistent and more longer run with that squeegee. Another good idea is, you know, mo most squeegee rubber comes in a roll form and you cut it to whatever length you need. And it sits around for a while and you try to roll it out, particularly if you're doing, you know, for, for bottle printing it's not so much of an issue, but when you get in a larger format and you're rolling that 12 foot roll of squeegee rubber out and you're trying to cut it and put it in your squeegee holder, the thing wants to keep recoiling up on you. So good practice is when you get new material in, if you have the space, store it flat, it's gonna make it a lot easier for the operators to, to cut it and install it into squeegee holder. Two angles of the squeegee. Um, one is the fixed angle, and that's basically your setting on your print head from the vertical position. Uh, typically that's somewhere between 15 and 20 degrees. And general rule of thumb, the higher the angle, the heavier the ink deposit you're gonna have. The more critical one is your print angle, which is your fixed angle on the press, how much squeegee pressure you have, what durometer hardness of the squeegee you have, your squeegee height sticking out of the holder, your off contact, those all make up your print angle. And what you don't want to do is have your print angle vary more than five to 10 degrees from your uh, fixed angle. You get beyond that, you're not printing with the edge of the squeegee anymore, you're printing with the side of the squeegee and you're no longer sharing ink through the screen, you're mashing it through the screen. There's that picture I was looking for. So this is what we used to do back in the day, now we have this technology here. So some people like it, some people don't, it's all personal preference. Squeegee pressure, it's the amount of force needed to make contact to the screen to the substrate and obtain a complete print. Contributing factors, as to how much pressure you need are in direct relation to your screen tension, off contact height, image size, and frame size. So you start seeing how some of the screen variables and how you set that screen up 
directly affect how much pressure you're going to need to get it to print. As always, you want to keep it at a minimum to reduce uh, screen wear, image distortion, and your print angle. Squeegee speed, that's mainly dictated by the ink flow and the uh, tackiness of the ink that you're using. When you got a real heavy, sticky ink, you're going to tend to want to print slower. And in general, if you want to print faster, you'll need to lower the viscosity of that ink so it transfers relatively quickly. So. I'll ask the room here, because I ask this to every customer I go into, if I walk out on the print room, if I walk out in the print room today, which picture am I going to see? Anybody want to answer? Yeah. Pardon me? Two on the right. It says that. Okay. I've had customers tell me this one. Uh -oh. This one. And I walk out there, and that actually looks good compared to what they're actually running. So uh, it's a very, very critical component because you got to. Relate to squeegee to a to a razor, like for, you know, for shaving. When you got a nice sharp razor, everything you know, everything comes off smooth. That's basically what you're trying to do here. You're trying to shear that ink through the screen. When you get to this, you're mashing it down through the screen. That's where you get mesh marks. You start getting starlighting because it's pulling this, it's pulling the ink back up in the screen. You're going to get smudge print. You're going to have Poor registration from color to color because now you're elongating this, the image that you're trying to print. Another factor with the squeegee uh, squeegee length. How do you size your squeegees now? Are you sizing it to your frame size? Or are you sizing it to the size of image that you're printing? Anybody? It's probably one of the most overlooked variables. We recommend you size the squeegee to the pattern and not the frame size and it should be no longer than one inch. In this case you could probably go even a half inch just because of the size format. Pass the image on each side. If it's too long it will result in using excessive squeegee pressure and this can cause premature screen wear, image distortion, and an uneven ink deposit. Well here's a worst case scenario. Um, Say your image is this big, inside the frame that big. What you want to look at here is the mesh contact angle. So when you get out this close to the frame, even though that screen tension may be uniform across the entire screen, the, the simple physics and geometry that you're applying here, when you get this close, takes at least two times more pressure to get that screen to print. Now we're, you know, we're basically reducing uh, our squeegee size or our image size within the screen. I can see our ink deposits flattening out, being more uniform. But ultimately, this is what you're looking for. And back to what I said about the screens, the more room you have for your image to hear, the more successful you're going to be. But there are equipment limitations. So you buy a press, you can only go to a frame size so big. And if your customers are like ours, they like to stress the limits. So you're, you're constantly trying to figure out the balance of what's going to work, what's not, and how do we make it work. So th this is where compromises may have to take place. You may not have this option to do that. But as long as you understand the ramifications of it, it makes it easier to accept. Flood bar, uh, basically two types. There's a zero degree, a 45 degree. Uh, one's for applying a thick coating of ink, ideal for heavy deposits in large open areas, and a 45 degree, uh, which I would say would be more prone to the uh, UV organics where you're trying to lay down a very thin layer of ink. Uh, some people still use squeegee rubber for their flood bars instead of a metal bar. Key thing about the flood bar, you want just enough pressure on that so it leaves an uh, even amount of ink across the surface of the screen. And you can use the flood bar for controlling slight ink deposits before changing other variables. 
because they're completely independent of the printing stroke. I'll just show you a couple different types. Ideally, when you flood the screen, you want to charge the stencil area here 100% with ink. That will give you good complete transfer. If you don't have enough pressure on it, then you're relying on the pressure of the squeegee and gravity to make up for this imbalance here. And then if you go except the other way, you're pushing the ink out onto the print side of the screen and then you got a big mess to clean up. Off contact, well, it's the distance from the bottom of the screen to the substrate. Your tension of the screen is the only factor that determines what that is. The tighter the screen, the lower the off contact you can run. Lower the off con or lower the tension, the higher you need to go to create that snap off. Too much off contact will result in having to use excessive squeegee pressure. You'll see image distortion, poor registration, reduced screen life, poor ink release, and poor ink deposit. So it's a very critical variable. Ideally, when you print, you want just enough off contact so as the squeegee passes across, the screen stays stuck for a split second to allow the ink to come out of the screen before it pops up. If you have too low attention or too low off contact, the screen is going to stick here and that's going to result in having double images or ghost images and sticking. Lastly, uh, environmental conditions. These are what are considered optimal. Temperature 68 to 72 degrees, humidity 50 to 60 percent, uh, positive pressure. Uh, we recommend at least minimum four, four complete changeovers, or changeovers of air per hour. Air quality is depending on your product and requirements, and static electricity is not your friend. So you want to eliminate it, especially if it affects your material hand. In reality, consistency is the key. A lot of environments, a lot of places you don't have the luxury of having air conditioning and heat, so you're kind of prone to what the plant's doing. As long as you can keep it consistent, you're not getting, it's 65 out there today, but then tomorrow it gets warm outside and it gets to be 120. You start seeing temperature and humidity fluctuations like that. You're going to play havoc with your screens, you're going to play havoc with your inks because those are both temperature and humidity sensitive. It's a general rule that for every, every degree in temperature you go up for ink, you change that viscosity anywhere from five to 800 centipoles. So it does become critical. If you're consistent, you can at least control that. But if you get the wild swings, it's gonna create a problem. We do recommend that the screens and inks be stored in the same environment as what they're gonna be printed in. Uh, if you can't do that, then we recommend it, trying to get them in that environment at least a full shift or two before they're going to be used so they can acclimate. Questions? Okay. Yes, sir. Without the heat pump, then why do it? You know, it, it all depends what your durability requirements are. 